on the far edge of the village. Nobody went there to accept to bury or to visit the dead. The street was rough and unpaved, unlike the others that ran across Brookside Hills. Tall, dried stalks clumped on the sides of the road like brown walls, keeping trespassers from crossing over the empty lot. The leafless trees reached out from the dark, grasping the sky with skeleton branches. There was no sound as though nature itself didn't want anything to do with Clinton Street. A young man walked briskly on Clinton Street. He wore a black vest over the white dirty shirt, black moldy smelling pants, and a pair of black shoes that hadn't seen a shoe brush in years. He had just turned 17 early this year, but with his stunted height and thin frame, he could have easily passed for 12. Under his right arm, was a six-pack he managed to swipe from the fridge while old Annie wasn't looking. He hated stealing from old Annie. She was sweet and probably the only person who was kind to him. Kind enough not to treat him like garbage like everybody did. He didn't have any money to pay for the beer. On his other arm was a pumpkin-shaped plastic bucket, like the ones the kids dangled under their noses of whoever opened the door. His bucket was already filled with candies. His name was Rupert Bartholomew, and he hated the cemetery. Rupert reached the rusty gate. He edged to the side where the wrought iron wall was bent open and slid carefully in, trying not to spill the candies like his life depended on it. Once inside, he walked rapidly to the center of the cemetery, where a candle was melting on top of one of the headstones. The cemetery was abysmal, as always. The dried flowers scattered on the ground didn't help get rid of the weird chemical smell that circulated the air. This is how death smells like, Rupert thought, wrinkling his nose. The ground was dusty and dry like a cake left in the oven. Nobody even thought of planting grass, but even if they did, no grass would grow in this kind of soil. Headstones protruded from the ground like jagged rows of teeth, waiting to close on an unsuspecting meal that would come near them. He broke into a run. He stopped in front of the headstone. The candle had been waiting for him, its thick tears streaming down the engraved name. He dropped a six-pack and a pumpkin on the ground and rested his hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath. Boo! Rupert stumbled backwards, his eyes as round as the moon, staring dumbly at the stocky young man who jumped from behind the headstone. The young man had a white face and his cheeks looked like they were rotting. The skin cracked and peeling off. Bruno Jenkins was ready for Halloween. Jeez, man, what's got into you? said Bruno as he moved from behind the headstone. He had his stupid little smile as he examined Rupert on the ground. They weren't actually friends in school. They didn't even belong in the same group. Rupert was one of the geeks who flocked the library between classes, discussing computers and role-playing games. Bruno was a loud jock, famous for his winning touchdowns and knew nothing else beyond the topic of sports. They met two years ago in the cemetery and had been stuck with each other ever since despite their many differences. Aw, uh, what's this, Rupi? You went out trick-or-treating without me? I thought we were friends, Bruno said. He kicked the bucket, sending the multicolored candies all over the cemetery ground. Rupert said nothing while he picked up the candies and put them back in the bucket. Jeez, leave it, man. Aren't you too old for candies? Bruno said, disgusted at the sight of Rupert. He reached for the beer with one motion. He took one and threw it towards Rupert. Here, have a beer. Rupert raised his hands to save his face from the flying can. He caught the beer, and the candy scattered back down to the ground, like broken pieces of glass. Bruno's chuckle echoed throughout the headstone. So what do you want to do tonight, Bruno said, opening a can. He drank half the can in one swig. Rupert shrugged. I don't know. What do you want to do? Me? We did my thing last year, remember? It's your turn now. 
He crushed the empty beer can with one hand, threw it over the headstones as far as he could, then reached for another one. Rupert had only taken three sips. He wondered how Bruno managed to drink that awful thing. He fell silent, staring at the cold sweat of the can in his hand. Well, who do you want to visit tonight? Bruno said after a few moments of silence. He knew Rupert was thinking of somebody, and with a little nudge, he would have a name. Rupert skimmed through his memories. He really wanted to get back to somebody this year that made his life miserable at school. So many names, so many faces, and so many miserable moments. He thought about Jose, the school janitor, and remembered the way he bickered at him and his friends around the school grounds every time he had a chance. Then Rupert remembered the janitor died early this year. His headstone still looked new and stood out from the rest of in the dark cemetery. Then there was Yvette, the senior girl who pranced around the school with her cronies of giggling girls, thinking she was the prettiest girl in Brookside Hills. She once poured a glass of orange juice on Rupert's head when he wrote her a letter. He hated that girl ever since and loved her at the same time. Okay, who is it, Bruno said, seeing Rupert flash a faint smile. Tell me, Ruthie. The name he had in mind had been attached to Bruno's name since he first stepped in school. They were inseparable like a pair of butt cheeks. Rupert hesitated. He didn't know if Bruno would have proved his pick. But then again, Bruno had picked Miss Sarah, the math teacher, last year. And he didn't even think twice about going with the plan, even though he really liked her a lot. And math was his favorite subject. I don't know, Rupert said trying to avoid Bruno's eyes. Joseph Taylor? Bruno smiled. Nice pick, Ruthie. Nice one. Grab the rest of the beer, will you? I'll get the shovel. He walked away from the headstone towards the dark road of Clinton Street, leaving the candlelight dance for the dead. Joseph Taylor was the P.E. teacher and Bruno's head coach. They both had muscular bodies and tailored would easily be mistaken for Bruno's uncle. Taylor lived at the far end of Brooks Drive with his mother and her two cats. Nobody at school had ever asked why he still lived with his mother, and he had a good reason not to. It would be a death sentence to ask a stupid question like that to someone with arms as thick as a toddler's waist. The two boys walked the length of Brookside Drive. The night was young, but the kids were almost finished with their trick-or-treating. The buckets were filled with treats and smiles painted on every face. Once in a while, some kids would throw a glare at the odd couple. The two looked too odd for trick-or-treating, after all. Even though their costumes and makeups looked convincing, the kids didn't want them on the streets tonight. Better costumes meant lots of treats and the kids of Brookside Hills were in no mood for any competition in this special night. Although the house at the end of the street looked the same as the other houses along the Brookside Drive, tonight it stood out like a gap between perfect white teeth. There were no decors of spider webs on the walls, no plastic bats hanging from the ceiling, no carved pumpkin heads on the porch. Taylor couldn't make the message any clearer. Halloween wasn't his favorite holiday. Inside, Taylor was on the couch watching TV and a bottle of beer in his hand. He decided to spend the night catching up with weekend games and killing the 12 bottles of beer in the fridge. This was his fifth bottle so far. Trick or treat! The voices behind the door reached Taylor like an ugly smell of a garbage can. He took a deep breath and turned to the door. He could have melted that door with his eyes. Scram! He said. As much as he wanted to hurl those trick-or-treaters from his porch, he decided to stay on the couch. He figured his loud, deep voice would be enough to scare them away. He turned back to the TV and missed his team make a touchdown. He nearly threw his beer at the TV. Trick-or-treat! He choked the bottom that tighter. Those kids got some nerves, he told himself. He bolted up from the couch 
and hit it straight for the door. Are you deaf? I told you to scram, he said as he opened the door. There was nothing on the porch except shadow. Taylor clenched his teeth and squinted his eyes, watching the darkness reveal any kind of movement. You want to play games, huh? He said. Come out now and get your treats. He stepped out the door, his stone-like heels bumping the wooden panels. The wind pulled the door closed. He spun around and threw the beer bottle. The bottle found the door and exploded. Taylor's temper rose from dangerous to deadly dangerous. He heard footsteps behind him, and his lips formed a grin. Kids will roll tonight. Trick or treat! Taylor drew himself up to his full height, and very slowly, as though giving the poor trick-or-treaters time to change their minds, he turned. To his satisfaction, the stocky young man didn't move. Taylor wasn't even bothered that the young man had a well-formed body fit for a quarterback. He was the P.E. teacher, and the head coach, after all, no teenager could ever take him down. Trick-or-treat, coach, Bruno said. Taylor paused. That voice, it sounded familiar. Yeah, it's me, coach, Bruno said, still hiding in the shadows. So would you give me a treat? Jerkins? Taylor started to raise his arms to give the boy a hug. God, he missed his best quarterback. How long had it been? Three years? Three long years since the team hadn't reached the final. Three long years since Shelf at his office had been deprived of the state championship trophy. Three long years since Bruno had. Taylor's arms fell back to his side. He remembered, Bruno shouldn't be here. He shouldn't be anywhere except under the ground. Come on, coach. Give me some treat for old times' sake, will you? Taylor took a step back. He felt the shards of the bottle under his feet, but he kept backing away. Then the sound of the shovel came whooshing behind him. The shovel found the back of Taylor's head, and he flung forward. Taylor held his head and tried to straighten himself up. Another swing to the head. Taylor stumbled back, his shoulder hitting the wall and breaking his fall. He turned and saw the thin boy behind him holding the shovel. Trick or treat, Mr. Taylor, Rupert said, raising the shovel above his head. Rupert swung the shovel towards Taylor's neck and kept swinging and swinging and swinging until the head of the sh shovel finally hit the wall. The two young men walked silently in the dead of the night, each holding a Halloween bucket. The children were long gone and probably feasting on their candies at their homes. Rupert couldn't suppress a satisfied grin all the way back to the cemetery. He was tired, and his arms felt like they had grown a few inches of muscle from swinging the shovel. But it was rewarding. He didn't feel the kind of satisfaction when they visited Miss Sarah, the math teacher, last year. Tonight had been a different experience, now that he actually participated in the killing. The rush was addictive, consuming and at the same time, liberating. They sat on the ground facing the headstone with the candle, now reduced to a stub, flickering in the starless evening as if saying goodbye. Rupert looked down at the pumpkin head bucket with a grin on his face. The pinkish gray organ quivered in the slight movement of the bucket. It reminded him of jelly, so sweet and so soft. So, Ruthie, feeling good? Bruno said. Rupert didn't answer, but widened his smile. I thought so, said Bruno, smiling broadly himself. He stood up, making the brain inside his own bucket wiggle. Well, see you next year, Rupi, Bruno said, giving a salute. He walked away from the headstone towards the heart of the dark cemetery. Yeah, see you next year, Rupert said. Rupert waited for the candle to flick out and die. Then he stood up and walked towards the rusty gates of the cemetery, his bucket swinging on his side. He took a left before reaching the gate and zigzagged through the headstones. 
He reached an open grave at the